Good morning. I am I'm Brandy Mullins, Minister to Children and Youth here at Circular Congregational Church. And I'm so glad that you are here. We are delighted to share this day with you. And if you're a visitor, we extend a special welcome to you. And we would love it if after the service, you would meet us at the Peace Poll, introduce yourselves. We'd love to get to know you. As we say at Circular, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. As an extension of that welcome, we thank you for wearing your masks as a gesture of love and solidarity for those in our community who are immunocompromised. Thank you for help us, helping us to be truly welcoming to all. If you need a mask, we have some in Keller Hall. And it is in that welcoming spirit that we pass the peace to one another. We do have a few announcements this morning. I'm going to start by turning it over to Conway. Good morning. I'm Conway Saylor, and I wanted to share just a, a little bit of a plug for the mission grants, which you see in your program can be submitted up till June 1st. I, for one, didn't really understand what these were, and I want to be sure you do because I bet someone out there has a brilliant idea that would be just the kind of thing our church is hoping to do. As part of our endowment fund, separate from our regular budget, we endow projects that touch people in the community, and particularly that engage members of the church in doing more outreach in the community. A lot of bigger projects that have grown to be priorities for our church and our community grew out of one or two circular people who were aware of a need, who had an innovative idea for addressing the need, and just needed a little bit of starter money or supplemental money to get that going. I've seen this uh, motivate people who are coming out of prison and in prison. I've seen it motivate African-American college students. And in the case of the grant I have this year, we're trying to give additional support to some school-aged children whose families had to evacuate Afghanistan. Now, many of you know there is a larger initiative church-wide to support this family and the basic needs that they have and help them grow towards independence. But as those of you with children know, children have other needs. So this little bit of mission grant money has helped us specifically expand the world and exposure of the children in the family. So we've bought bathing suits that the girls who are Muslim can swim in in public. We've uh, brought them park passes so they can enjoy Charleston County's parks. Little things that make a huge difference to children. We've helped the teenagers learn to drive with these funds. So you may be thinking, well, I, I can't do a big project like that. But the whole idea is for your good idea to get in a form that could make a tangible difference and for you to bring others in. And that's exactly what my experience have been in this. So on a personal note, I want to say I have learned about a whole world that I never knew existed of immigrant children trying to blend in when they come to America. I have met people in this congregation that I would never have known on a personal level because they joined us in this effort. Many of you I'm looking at, I'm not going to start naming names, but you've been driving these children to Kaleidoscope, you've been taking them to the parks the youth are gonna get involved in an event with them in a few weeks. So please consider submitting a mission grant and I am delighted to help you understand what you need to do and how to do it. It is not an arduous process. So I'll be back in the back after the service and I hope you'll talk to me about it. Thanks. And speaking of the Ahmadi family, we would love for you to join us this Saturday, May 20th, 
for a family fun day with their family. There will be lots of food and fun, so please see your newsletter. Talk to me, talk to Anna Kusadis or Annie Steele for more details, but we would love to have as many people there as possible. Um, oh, be Jazz Vespers, Alva Anderson is the featured musician, 6 p.m. tonight. Please see your bulletin app and newsletter for more information about these events and other things happening at Circular and in our community. In fact, I have to take my mask off for this. Finally, it is my privilege to share the most delightful announcement of all. Last week, our dear Peggy Pearl and Bill Thornby were married right outside under the oak tree. Get choked up. They're hosting the Fellowship Hour in Keller Hall after church today in celebration of their marriage. I know you will want to give them your love as they celebrate theirs. Sorry, I, my grin was too big, it wouldn't fit under my mask. <laughs> now I invite all of us into a time of centering as we prepare ourselves for worship. Slowing down and giving yourself full permission to shift out of doing mode and into being mode for the next little while. And as you breathe in, let your body begin to relax, using the exhale to melt and surrender into your seat, feeling that support. Visualize a beautiful, warm, white light enveloping your entire body feeling this warm, healing energy and receiving it, letting each breath soften the heart. There is deeper wisdom here, not intellectual, but intuitive, knowing. As we move into worship, may we stay open for an opportunity to be instead of do, and to listen carefully to the deep wisdom that is available to us. Let us worship together.
Good morning. I invite you to stand with me in body or spirit for the responsive call to worship and uh, the congregation will read the bold type. It is entitled Blessing the Mothers by Jan Richardson, Sanctuary of Women blog. Who are our first sanctuary? Who fashioned a space of blessing with their own being, with the belly, the bone, and the blood? Or if not with these, then with the durable heart that offers itself to break and grow wide, to gather itself around another as refuge, as home. Who lean into the wonder and terror of loving what they can hold but cannot contain, who remain in some part of themselves always awake, a corner of consciousness keeping a perpetual vigil, who knows that the story is what endures, is what binds us, is what runs deeper even than blood. And so they spin them in celebration of what abides and benediction on what remains. A simple gladness that latches us on and graces us on our way. And now will you join us in singing hymn number 11, Bring Many Names, verses 1, 2, and 6. Good morning. I'm Dale Snyder. I'll be reading the scripture today. It's from Wilda C. Gaffney's A Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church, Year W. This is Psalm 145, verses 8 through 19. Full of grace and a mother's love is the mother of all slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. The womb of life is good to all, and her mother love is upon all she has made. They shall praise you, wellspring of life, all your works and all your faithful shall bless you. Of the glory of your majestic rule shall they speak and your might shall they declare. To make known to the woman born her mighty works and the glorious splendor of her majestic rule. 
Your majesty is an everlasting majesty, and your sovereignty endures throughout all generations. Blessed be the living God, and blessed be her name forever and ever. Faithful is the ever-living God in all her words, and gracious in all her deeds. Blessed be the living God, and blessed be her name forever and ever. The merciful one upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bent over. The eyes of all look to you, and you give to them their food at the right moment. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The faithful one is righteous in all her ways and loving in all her works. The ever-present God is near to all who call on her, to all who call on her in truth. The desire of all who revere her, she fulfills, and their cry she hears and delivers them. May we hear the wisdom in the words. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to invite the children to come up for children's time. Come on, children. Don't be slow. My name is Joanne, and I'm glad to see you all. And what I thought is, okay, so y'all are really good at imagining, right? I mean, y'all can see things in your head. Okay, so imagine a beautiful day, a big blue sky, puffy white clouds, sunshine, birds are singing, the leaves of the trees, you can hear them rustling, and you can feel the warm sun on your arms. Isn't that a wonderful image? Yeah. Now this is a little harder, it's a little abstract. Imagine the love of your mother. I mean, I, I can't really see it. You know you are loved because of her attention and the kindness he sh she shows you, by her making sure that you have the right food to keep you healthy, and also every now and then you get the occasional treat or reward. She sees that you are dressed warmly when it's cold outside and smears sunscreen on you to protect you from too much sun. With all of these everyday acts of kindness, she is demonstrating her deep, abiding love for you. She loves and accepts you even when you're not perfect and nobody is perfect. Okay, that's gone from like easy to a little harder. Now here's the real challenge. Imagine the love of God. How do we experience the love of God? one way you can see it is you watch people being kind to one another. Watch for people feeding those who are hungry and giving warm coats to those who need them. Watch human beings comforting each other. Another way is to listen to music and sing songs that touch your heart. To look at pictures and paintings and photographs that touch your heart. Go into buildings that are so beautiful that you can only think that the builder must have been inspired by God. We're going to bring that back around to where we started. Another way you can feel God is to look at those same trees, the birds, feel the sun on your skin, the breeze through your hair, all the beauty and awe of God's creation. There is the love of God in all of that. And so we'll have our prayer right now. God is love, is what I'm thinking. 
Okay. Dear Creator, our Maker, we are surrounded by a love that enfolds us and binds us together, a love that is always awake and keeps vigil over us. We are thankful for our mothers and all those in our lives that show us what love is. Amen. Okay, now let me see. Um, now the co Children's Church will continue if you follow Miss Brandy. And if you are new to the church, uh, we would like to ask that you, uh, if you're visiting for the first time, please walk back with your child to share information. Good morning. My name is Bill Epps, and I'm uh, honored to say a quick note about what you will hear next from the choir. Uh, um, this is a setting of a very famous poem by E.E. E. Cummings, who many of us of a certain generation know for his uh, creative use of spelling and syntax. Uh, I'm going to read the, the poem before we sing it. Um, it is, I thank you, God, for this a most amazing day. And also just mention that the uh, setting itself is, was a gift. It was a gift to a member of our choir, Rue Monsell, from her son, Todd, and um, is absolutely beautiful, so. I thank you, God, for this most amazing day, for the leaping, greenly spirits of trees, and a blue, true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I, who have died, am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birth day of life and love and wings and the gay, great happening, illimitable earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing be lifted from the no of all nothing, merely human being, doubt, unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are opened.
Thank you so much, choir, for that beautiful anthem. I invite you to join me in a moment of peaceful reflection, closing our eyes and opening our hearts to the beloved as we go into our prayer of confession. Beloved spirit, Please help me to deliver this prayer of confession in keeping with the following words of the poet, Mary Oliver. A prayer does not have to be the blue iris. It could be weeds in a vacant lot or a few small stones. Just pay attention, then patch a few words together and don't try to make them elaborate. This isn't a contest. Rather, the doorway into thanks and a silence in which another voice may speak. So we thank you for this glorious day. We confess we sometimes fail to see it. We thank you for the love and grace you have so freely given us. We confess that we sometimes fail to appreciate it. We thank you for all beings which touch our lives. We sometimes forget to give thanks. And on this Mother's Day, we acknowledge that many of us have a complicated relationship with our mother. We thank you for the humanity of all mothers. We sometimes forget their humanity. We end this prayer of confession with gratitude for our many blessings. And we ask for your gentle reminder, should we fail in remembering such gratitude. Amen. Would you please stand in body and spirit for the singing of our next hymn, number 37 in the supplemental hymnal.
Good morning. It is so good to see all of you today. And I want to tell you a story about my little sister. My mother and stepfather adopted children late in life, so I have a sister that is just 21, just a few years older than my oldest son. And when she was younger, she had two turtles. They were about this big, okay? And she named them after my aunt and uncle, so their names were Margaret and Henry. <laughs> and Margaret and Henry lived in an enclosure that was a little box about this big. Well, she had them for a couple of years and then she got bored. Little Margaret and Henry needed a new home. So they were rehomed to my nephew's bedroom in North Carolina, my teenage nephew. And my nephew and his dad are really into building things. So they built a new home for Margaret and Henry, a home about this big. Can you guess what happened to Margaret and Henry? <laughs> That's right, they grew. And after living for a couple of years as little turtles, Margaret and Henry have now lived for five years as turtles that are this big. Yeah. Um, and they're still alive five years later. So I want you to remember that story of Margaret and Henry because I will circle back to that at the end of this teaching. But for now, let's just put Margaret and Henry over here to the side. Um, as I began preparing for this teaching, I came to a shocking realization. In my 49 years of attending church, yes, I was born and raised in a church, I have only once been a member of a church who had a female pastor. And that church is this one, and the pastor's me. <laughs> Over the years, I have heard women preach and have attended churches with female pastors, but this is the first church that I've been a member of that has a female on staff with the title pastor. And I would guess that that is probably true for many of you listening today. And I wonder if what I'm going to say next may also be true for you. So even though there were no female pastors in the churches where, when I grew up, my spirituality was nurtured mostly by women. It was my mom taking me to church. It was my mom reading me Bible stories at night and praying with me before bed. It was my grandmothers, both in the U.S. and in Brazil, taking me along when they went to visit a friend who needed someone to talk to. It was the countless female Sunday school teachers. It was my youth minister in high school. There were many women along the way, midwives of my faith. All of these women have nurtured my spirit but it was always the men who held the official titles, the official spiritual titles. The men were always the head of the spiritual institutions that I was a part of. Now, I come from a line of pastors. My great-grandfather was a traveling preacher in South Carolina, and he had five churches. My grandparents were missionaries to Chile, and they both went to seminary and got seminary degrees, but it was my grandfather who was the pastor, and my grandmother led all of the women's activities. When I started feeling a call to ministry, being a pastor never crossed my mind. In fact, I wanted nothing to do with it. I remember specifically saying to my seminary friends, I never want to be a pastor. And this was strange to them because most of my friends in seminary, women and men, were there to become pastors. And most of them have become pastors. But one big reason that I did not want to be a pastor is that I found churches to be very dysfunctional and I didn't want to have anything to do with that. 
But in hindsight, I think that a major reason that I did not want to be a pastor was that I did not fit the role of pastor that I had experienced my entire life. What I saw did not mirror back to me the possibility of consideration. After seminary in 2001, I was ordained, but I didn't see myself as being ordained to be a pastor, but rather to be ordained to work outside of the church, not within a church. And it took me 12 years of working part-time here at Circular as the Director of Adult Faith Development for me to realize that my gifts did fit that of a pastor. I had to come to that realization through the experience of being a part of a healthy church, and I had to kind of come to it sideways realizing that I love church work and that I had something to offer. After my ordination, my friend gave me this cross, and Francis, um, you can put it up for everybody to see. And it's also on your bulletin. And as you can see on this cross, we have many images of women. Women teaching, women leading small groups, women nurturing children, women harvesting, women tending the flocks, and a woman with her arms stretched out in the middle in a gesture of praise and gratitude. Thank you, Francis. All of this is depicted on a cross, the Christian symbol of sacrifice and of holiness. And I confess that when I first saw the cross, this cross, I was a little um, surprised by it because it felt countercultural. We don't see women on the cross. The image of these women on a cross deeply touched me, and this cross sits on the wall above my desk, reminding me that female qualities are indeed holy. During the next three months of our pastor's sabbatical, senior pastor's sabbatical, the teachings you will be hearing from this pulpit will mostly be from women. You'll hear from Randy, from my seminary friend, Abby Henrich, who's preaching next week, from Susan Dunn, and from me. At Circular, we want to be inclusive, and, and we are very intentional in terms of hearing from voices across the spectrum of gender. There are a few males on the preaching schedule as well, but I don't really feel bad about the amount of female voices you will be hearing. Circular has had about 342 years, give or take a few Sundays, of the masculine voice coming from this pulpit. So I think three months of the feminine voice will be okay. More than okay. I think it'll be good for us. So my hope on this Mother's Day in this teaching is not to pit female against male or feminine against masculine. Frankly, I don't care for these binaries, but I do want to explore how we have historically given the masculine voice or the masculine end of the spectrum an authority and a holiness that needs correction. I want to explore how a course correction is good not just for those who identify as women in, but it is good for all of us, no matter where we find ourselves on the spectrum of identity, of gender identity. The psalm we read today was from a translation, translation by Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. Did you notice that it sounded a little different? You probably noticed um, that she translates psalm, the psalm differently. Um, Dr. Gaffney is a womanist scholar who has written a women's lectionary for the whole church. And in her lectionary, she not only gives suggested um, scripture texts for the church year that are more inclusive of the stories of women in the Bible, but she also applies her own scholarship and her study of Greek and of Hebrew to provide us with insights into the original text. She often changes nouns and pronouns 
from masculine to feminine, as a way to remind us that the Bible was written in a deeply patriarchal time in a system, and that it was written by men. I like to use her translations of the Bible when I do teachings because I think it is important to do what we can to undo the centuries of limiting God to masculine imagery. Doctor, excuse me, I get very thirsty when I talk. Dr. Gaffney writes in her introduction about why she explicitly chooses feminine language as preferable to gender neutral language for her goals. She writes, explicitly feminine language is preferable to inclusive and neutral language which obscures and erases women and girls. In addition, singular, neuter, gender, and inclusive plurals do not disrupt the learned gender patterns as many readers and hearers interpret them through their previously learned gender pattern and even if they are neutral, experience them as male. So Gaffney's Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church points out that traditional biblical translations often translate words as masculine even when the roots of the word were feminine. So we have lost that. In the text for today, she points out that the root word for the way God's love is expressed comes from the Hebrew word for womb. So instead of using the typical translation of God as having compassion, the word compassion, she translates that God has mother love for all she has made. And we have been robbed of this image, this subtle word of womb-like love that God has for us. So whenever you read the word compassion in the Hebrew Bible, substitute womb-like love. Can you imagine what it, difference it would make to grow up hearing about God as having womb-like love? This womb-like love of God is available to all of us. It is also available in all of us, no matter our gender identity. I happen to be female and have a womb, but I am a mother through adoption, and no one could argue with me that I don't have womb-like love for my children. <laughs> you don't have to have a womb or use your womb to make babies to have womb-like love. This is available to all of us, both biologically and spiritually. All are included. In the Bible, God is also referred to as a mother hen. The Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God are called Sophia, and that was a woman's that feminine name. God's spirit that resides with the Israelites in the wilderness is called Shekinah, which literally translates as she who dwells. God is overshadowed, excuse me, God is also depicted as having breasts and nursing her people. All of this and more have been overshadowed by the male image of God that has been handed down to us. And this matters. In the article, God in Feminine Form by Deneen Akers, Akers points out that our texts and traditions have named and imagined divinity as he for so often and so long that many of us have started to think God is actually masculine and male. And this has, an enormous, has enormous implications for how children of all genders grow up imagining or not their essence as part of the image of God. Masculine language for God contributes to a world in which women and girls remain marginalized and seen as less than and the mothering and feminine qualities in all genders are undervalued. Feminine God language is liberating for us all. Our God includes and transcends the full spectrum of gender. None of us is a complete binary, and neither is God, and this matters. 
It matters because if God is a heteronormative male and God is holy, then everything else is less than. So our God image, our God language needs a corrective. We need to remember that God is a mothering God, a loving mother who wants to nurture and comfort and keep her children safe. So God is mama, mom, mommy, mama, madre, mamãe, mamã. I do want to say, if the male imagery for God speaks to you, and God as Father has a special place in your heart, by all means treasure it. As long as you remember that God is more than that, and that others are justified by calling God by feminine or neutral names if they want. So back to my story of the Henry and Margaret. We have been living like the little turtles, Margaret and Henry, in this tiny box of who we think God is. But the box we have for God is too small. And it also makes us too small. We need to rehome ourselves to a bigger, more inclusive image of God. We need to let our children experience God in the fullness of their imaginations. We need them to be able to see God's image in them, no matter how they identify themselves. God has feminine energy. God has a mothering heart. God is feminine wisdom. God is all of this and more. So on this Mother's Day, I invite you to take some time to remember God as a mothering God with mother love for you. And may our mothering God bless you and keep you. Amen. This is our time in our service where we collect the offering. And you may do this by using the offering plates or through our church app or website. And the money that we collect will be used to support our church, which is a house of welcome for all people, and to further our work for peace and justice in our community and wider world. So it is in that spirit that you are invited to give.
as is our practice here at Circular, we invite you to raise your hand if you have a joy or a concern that you want to share aloud. And Randy will bring you the microphone. And just so you know, what you say will be on the live stream right now. But when the video for our worship service is posted on YouTube later, uh, those will be omitted. And you may also submit confidential prayer requests by using the cards in the pews and passing them, putting them in the prayer box right there, kind of close to the door. There's a colorful painted box there. And those will go to me and to the spiritual care team and kept confidential if you'd like. Let us enter into prayer together. Mothering God, we pause on this day to remember. We remember your mothering love for us, and we pray for your mothering love to be in our midst in all that we do. On this day, we say a prayer of gratitude for our mothers, those living or not, those who did their very best, as well as those who could not, those who gave birth to us, and those who loved us as though they had, those who were spiritual mothers to us, with wombs or not. We give thanks for them and the life they bore through biology and or through love. On this day, we call upon your mother love to be close to those who are lonely, those who are scared, those who are grieving, those in the grips of addiction, those who are sick and those who care for them, those who feel lost. Shelter them under your wings, Mama Hen God. May they know deep down that they are loved and made in your image. May your mothering love be in all of the concerns shared here today and those we hold silently in our hearts. And we know your mothering love celebrates the joys we shared and those we keep in our hearts also. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Please stand in body or spirit and join us in singing hymn number 426, verses 1, 2, and 4.
And now may the mothering love of God keep you, nurture you, and protect you as you go. Amen.